uh, just starting with my summary. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I'm assuming that most people here don't know that much about exoplanets, so I, a lot of my talk is going to be very introductory. Um, but I am going to try and talk a lot about the engineering and the data science that goes into the problem. So, so it's going to get a little engineering-y. Uh, and please, uh, well, I don't know if it's questions at the end, but I'll give you some opportunities to remember questions, which we can talk about at the end. Um, so here are my conclusions, or my summary. Uh, I'm going to show you that exoplanets are very hard to find, so we have to do very good, very careful data analysis to find them. Um, I'm going to talk about search, where we try to find planets. I'm going to show you how we find planets in a very, very fine data set that comes from a NASA satellite. I'm not really going to talk about characterization, uh, but of course, once you find them, you have to understand what their physical properties are. I am going to say a little bit about population inferences. You only get noisy measurements of the planets, and you, there's a lot of kinds of planets you don't get to see. And so inferring what the whole population looks like uh, is a big challenge, and we use uh, probabilistic inference there. Actually, at all stages, this will be very much a probabilistic inference talk, and I'll use a lot of uh, Bayesian words. Uh, uh, but uh, there's a, there is a, uh, if you don't, if you're offended by Bayes, there's a frequentist uh, description of everything I do. Um, uh, here, scientific conclusions, if you're looking for some science, I'm going to uh, mention at the end that about a percent of sun-like stars host a planet that's like the Earth. That's our current conclusion. Uh, we, my group gets lower numbers than other groups, and I think that's for very, for reasons that we are doing the, we are actually doing the data analysis more responsibly. Um, but it is true that this is a low number. We have the lowest number uh, in the literature. Um, one odd thing that everybody agrees on in the astrophysics community these days is that solar systems are actually, uh, other solar systems are not that similar to our own. We don't seem to be in a typical kind of solar system. And that situation is very interesting for a number of reasons. One is, of course, it throws doubt onto everything we do in cosmology. I'm also a cosmologist. Actually, my origin is cosmology, and a lot of what, what I do is cosmology. And I'm going to be here at the Simons Foundation uh, next year, and I'm going to spend that time actually working on cosmology. And one of the issues with cosmology is we only get to observe one universe, and we're trying to understand how it was created and what the general principles are, and we only get one observation. Well, all of the work we did in our solar system, trying to understand how solar systems were created, most of that work turned out to be wrong, because we look at other solar systems and they just don't look like ours at all. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, and one thing that's very important is, and I'm not really going to talk about this, I, but I must say it because it's really important, is that very little is known about Jupiter-like planets. We know about planets that are as big as Jupiter, but we don't know much about planets that are on long periods like Jupiter. And the fact that Jupiter is big and on a long period in our solar system affects a lot of the dynamics in the solar system. It's very important to how the solar system formed. And so, actually, the, if, you ask, if you're asking the physical question of, like, how did our solar system get the physical properties it has now, we actually don't know that much about that yet. Uh, a lot of people are working on, on that, including me. Um, OK, good. This is my title slide. Uh, uh, one thing I have to say is all of the work in this talk was done by Dan Foreman Mackey, who is a graduate student who just uh, finished at NYU, who is truly uh, one of the best scientists I've ever worked with. He's off to University of Washington uh, on the Sagan Fellowship, which is NASA's uh, Exoplanet Fellowship. Um, uh, various other people here involved. Some people here who are data scientists will know the name Bernard Shulkoff. Uh, Shulkoff is responsible for kernel SVM and other kernel methods back in the day. And now he's all excited about astronomy. And we are providing him a platform uh, to help us uh, uh, understand our data. OK, good. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the NASA. Uh, Kepler mission, everything I'm going to show you in this talk will be Kepler data. It comes from a Kepler sa uh, NASA satellite. And what this satellite did in its main, it has two phases. I'm mainly actually going to talk about its second phase. But its first phase is it stared at 150,000 stars for four years and took an observation every 30 minutes. And that means it got about 70,000 measurements of 150,000 stars. Not just all in the Milky Way, all fairly nearby in the disk of the Milky Way. So the f I'll show you the field in a second. It's slightly above the disk plane. So most of the typical star is within a kiloparsec in the disk in our own Milky Way. So this is nearby, relatively nearby stars. Actually, the big problem of this mission is we would like it to have been more nearby 
Um, but yes, all in the Milky Way. And all we're doing is measuring the brightness of those stars. So it measured the brightness of all of these stars. Um, so it's a very simple experiment. You're just measuring the brightnesses of stars over and over again. And I'll explain why in a second. And we're looking for uh, exoplanet transits, meaning we're looking for the moment. So, very, so lots of these stars have planets orbiting them. But very occasionally, a star has a planet orbiting so precisely aligned that it actually blocks out a little bit of the light of the star. So we're looking for those cases, the rare planets that happen to pass in front of the star from our point of view. And of course, when you look at stars, you don't see the big, well, the sun you can see as a, as a resolved object, but all other stars you see as just a point. So we're looking for little brightness changes in these stars. That's what we're going to look for. And we're going to find periodic brightness changes in the stars, and those will be our planets. And that's how we're going to find planets. Um, and the Kepler satellite found thousands of planets. And it surveyed 150,000 stars. It found thousands of planets. You might think, well, planets are rare. But actually, that means planets are very common because it requires perfect alignment of the orbit with our line of sight to get one of these transits. So actually, this data set is consistent with essentially all stars having planets. We now think that almost all stars have planets. I mean, maybe it's only 30% of stars. But a very large fraction of stars have planets. Um, and of order 1% of them have planets that are very like the Earth, rocky planets that are 300 Kelvin. Um, OK, good. So here's what the satellite looks like. It's a very simple design. And, and NASA has been, one of the things that's happened in space science is people have figured out incredibly simple ways to make important scientific measurements. This satellite has only four moving parts, which are these four reaction wheels. I mean, you can't read this because it's all pixelated. But um, uh, it has only four moving parts, which are four reaction wheels for pointing. Everything else is just static. It's just electronics and a beautiful mirror. And those four reaction wheels, two of them failed. So it has four moving parts, and two of them failed. Um, so this is why we try and build very, very simple satellites. Um, this was a very inexpensive satellite by NASA standards. It's very hard to, in fact, a significant fraction of the cost of the satellite was just literally the launch. That was about half the price of the satellite. Um, what it did is it observed one patch of sky. Now, I, I'm an astronomer, so I don't know what any of these stars are. But, um, but some people in the roo in room might, because some people in the room uh, probably have backyard telescopes. But anyway, um, we're just off the galactic plane. And there's the locations of 42 CCDs. So that's 42 CCDs. That's the footprint that it observed on the sky, where it observed for four years. Um, and that's an image. So this is an image downloaded by the telescope. In general, it didn't download full images. There are actually, this thing is not orbiting the Earth. This thing is orbiting uh, the sun on an Earth trailing orbit, which means it has to use the deep space network to communicate back to Earth. Because it has to use the deep space network, it's bandwidth limited. Actually, one of the th themes of all data science is I think all important experiments are bandwidth limited now. Um, in fact, I was just over at the Climate Corporation in San Francisco, and they're telling me that combine harvesters are bandwidth limited, uh, which sort of surprised me that combine harvesters have a bandwidth at all. But it turns out that there's a data feed from combine harvesters, and actually they would rather bump up the cell phone network all over the country uh, to do better prediction of crop yields. Um, but anyway, uh, so we didn't get this image all the time. We only got little patches centered on the stars. And you might not see many stars in here, but I can assure you there's, there's about a million stars visible in that image, and about 150,000 of them we downloaded, every, or they downloaded every 30 minutes. We, sometimes I use we to mean the astronomical community. Um, I actually wasn't involved in designing or building this instrument at all. Oh, and one thing I, I had on a view graph back here, which I should just say, is all data completely public. One of the main reasons that everyone in the world should be an astronomer with at least a little bit of their time is that all of our data are public. Uh, any data made by NASA become public after a year. These data were made public immediately when they were taken. Um, all the data I'm going to show you are completely public. All of the code that I'm going to use is open source and released in repositories. Anybody can play in this playground. And many discoveries have come from strange places. Um, OK, good. Uh, so here's a little piece of light curve. And now I want to contextualize for you just how hard this project is. So this is the brightness of a star. But what we've done is we've scaled out the mean. So we've, we've 
we've divided by the mean, and then we subtracted one. So if the star did nothing, the brightness of the star would just hold at zero. And then these are like deviations of the brightness of the star, and they're written in parts per million. Okay, we're talking about parts per million changes to the brightness of stars. And this is a planet, what you're seeing here are periodic, see how periodically there's downward going uh, residuals at the locations of these green lines? Those are places where the star got fainter by 400 parts per million for a couple hours every eight or so days. That's days. Oh yeah, this is, <laughs> it's so amusing. Anyway, this D is days, this is in days. One of the things that's amusing is the satellite is orbiting the, the sun, so its, it's uh, line of sight to the field is changing with time, which means that the clock, though it's ticking regular time in spacecraft coordinates, isn't clicking regular time in an inertia, well, in a, gravitation-free inertial frame. It is an inertial frame, of course, but it's not uh, at the barycenter, say, of the solar system. So this is correcting to the solar system barycenter what the time would have been for these observations if you had been resident. Of course, if you're at the, if you're at the barycenter, you would be toast, because it's like 100,000 degrees at the barycenter of the, of the solar system. But anyway, um, literally, well, no, you'd be beyond toast. You'd be vaporized. Um, OK. so. Uh, so we're talking about parts per million. So no one, and an Earth, I'll show you in a view graph in a second, the Earth, say you want to detect an Earth. This is nothing like the Earth, this object here. This is an object that is orbiting every eight days, not every 365 days. Um, if you want to find the Earth, you're looking for 100 parts per million signal, not 400 parts per million, looking for 100 parts per million signal, and it lasts for 13 hours and it happens once every 365.25 days. See how you're looking for this tiny signal that's incredibly sparse in the data. For the vast majority of the time, for the 364.75 days that it isn't transiting, there's absolutely no influence of the planet at all on your observations. And then there's a 100 parts per million influence of the observation for 13 hours, and then it's off again. So this is a very hard signal to find. Um, and uh, that's what we're looking for. But anyway, that just gives you a sense of what the data looked like. By the way, uh, if you have good eyes, you'll see that the, the, this representation makes the data look very much, the noise in the data look very close to Gaussian. And a lot of our sources of noise are very close to Gaussian because we're doing photon counting and we're doing parts per mil, we're doing like 100 parts per million measurements. That means we have 10 to the 8 or more photons in each of these observations, because you know the square root of 10 to the 8 is 10 to the 4. And so, so we are very, it's very much Gaussian noise. And that's a very nice thing, at least the photon noise. There's other kinds of noise which aren't so pleasant. But anyway, we were going to talk about those. And then if you take these data and you fold them on this period, you mod it with this period, it looks like that. And you can see the dip. Uh, and it's actually got a shape, and we can actually see some aspects of that shape, although these data are very noisy. Well, not very noisy. These are very low noise. Actually, but prior to the Kepler mission, no one had ever used CCDs at this level of precision. We weren't even sure whether CCDs could do it. Uh, it's never been done before. From the ground, the best observations from ground-based telescopes are not nearly this precise. OK, good. Uh, what happened? Uh, Kepler, two of Kepler's uh, reaction wheels failed, as I mentioned. Once you're down to, so if you think about uh, geometry, solid body geometry, you need three reaction wheels to point. Satellites are launched with four because you don't want wheels to go through zero crossings. There's some nice math problems there that the engineers solve. Because when something goes through a zero crossing, it's momentarily not moving. And things that are not moving in outer space tend to freeze. Uh, it's a bad environment. The space environment's bad. Um, but anyway, after the second, uh, after the first reaction wheel failed, they could still operate, but there were some zero crossings. And sure enough, one of the, the next wheel failed on a zero crossing. Um, and so they had to redesign. Either they had to end the mission and give up, uh, which was NASA's default choice, or they had to repropose. And what they did is they reproposed a mission that very cleverly orients the telescope in the orientation where the environmental torque is as close to zero as possible. What does the environmental torque come from? It comes from the fact that the satellite's being illuminated by the sun. And there's momentum flux in those photons, and the thing is not uniformly painted relative to its center of mass. That wasn't a design condition. They could have painted it 
such that it would be zero toric object, but they never crossed their mind that that would be a useful thing to do. Um, we now know for future. Um, so they switched to a new mode, and unfortunately in this mode, they couldn't stare at the same patch for four years. They stare now at 12 patches each for 80 days. And uh, that changes the mission, and that changes what kinds of science we can do, but uh, it's more exciting in many ways because we're going to see more of the galaxy. We're going to see it less well, but we're going to see more of it. So this is very exciting. Again, all the data are immediately public, and the first group ever to make a catalog of planets in this data is mine. So this is, our, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit. We're going to talk about how we did that. So this I mentioned for uh, a few minutes ago. Um, in order to get some kind of transiting signal, you need very good alignment. You need to get lucky. Um, and that means there are many biases in what we get. We don't observe a fair census of exoplanets. We observe a very unfair census of exoplanets. Um, and it's very hard to find the Earth. And I showed you, the, the data I showed you was, was not reasonable, not fair, the data I showed you. Almost, the data are all much worse than that. In fact, the data I showed you there wasn't really raw data. That was data that we had recalibrated uh, to remove systematic effects. Um, in fact, both stars and the spacecraft uh, imprint signals on the light curves that are much bigger than the amplitude of the signal we looking, we're looking for. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. Um, so the problem is that we have to model the noise. And all, of, all we do in my group is model noise, basically. It it's, uh, it's, takes a lot of commitment to be an astronomer in my group. Um, because, uh, you know, usually people become astronomers for because, like, it's so beautiful out there. Um, and we, uh, we think about amplifiers on CCDs. Um, but one important part of noise is the stochastic variability of the sun or any star. I've phrased this in terms of the sun, but the sun is very typical for the stars we're looking at. Um, there's stochastic variability because, of course, the surface of the sun is this con like convecting, roiling surface. And so there's some stochastic variability from this, um, from this random motions of the surface. Um, and we're going to use data-driven models uh, to to explain the sun's variability. We don't want to, we're not building a physical model of the sun in this project. And one of the things we believe is we believe we could do better by building physical models of the stars than we are now. By we're using effective models of the stars, not physics models. Um, and then there's spacecraft issues. And the, there, it's, it's, this is, gets very, very detailed. But if the satellite is satellite's trying to point at this field, as the satellite's pointing drifts, the the way what happens is the star moves relative to the focal plane. And that means the star illuminates the pixels of the focal plane differently as it drifts. And we've learned from the Kepler mission that CCDs, even beautifully calibrated science grade CCDs, have very small variations in their sensitivity even within each pixel. So in the original Kepler mission, the, the pointing was very good, and, and the stars were only moving by uh, maybe a hundredth of a pixel during the mission. But even a movement of a hundredth of a pixel introduces signals into the data that are larger than the amplitude we're looking for, because the pixels themselves have gradients in their sensitivity. So it's really, we're really pushing the instrumentation to the very limit. Um, and this is all worse in this K2 mission, because in the K2 mission, we've lost two of the reaction wheels, and so the pointing is worse. So, um, good, so what we're going to do, again, we're going to build a data-driven model of this, but we're going to use the shared information across all the stars. Because anything, and actually there's a philosophical slide next. Okay, good. All of these are your philosophical slide. Ah, yeah, here's my philosophical slide. Uh, this is Bernard Shulkoff talking. The idea behind the project is if you see two, two stars in the Kepler field, they're enormously far apart in real space. They don't connect, they're not connected to each other causally at all. Which means if, any, if two stars are moving in a similar way, if their brightnesses are changing in a similar way, that's because the spacecraft is doing something that's imprinting onto both of them. So we're going we're gonna to try and understand the common signals that are common to all the stars, and we're going to use that to build a noise model 
that explains what the spacecraft was doing. So we're, going to, we're building an effective model of a spacecraft. That's kind of the idea here. Um, now, we've also explored with building a physical model of a spacecraft, which is also a fun thing to do. Um, but it, that, it turns out in the short term, that's a harder project. We are proceeding on that, but we're starting with the effective model of the spacecraft. So that's why this is truly data science. Uh, we're going to pull a spacecraft out of the data. Okay, so here's what the raw photometry looked like for a typical star. So this is a typical star in the K2 data set. Here's the 82 days or whatever where we observe this star. And now notice that the vertical axis is in parts per thousand, not in parts per million. So this has a huge amplitude variability here that's much bigger than the signal we're looking for. We're looking for 100 parts per million or 0.1 parts per thousand, and there's the, there's the, still damn good. This is still much better than any photometry we've ever done from the ground. But you can see a lot of structure here. If you look carefully, you see how there's a structure here that's like a stripiness, like that? That stripiness is because the way they operated the satellite in this mission is that it would drift slightly, and then every six hours they'd fire the thrusters and bring it back, and then we'd drift a bit and they'd bring it back, drift a bit and bring it back, and so there's a stripiness every six hours in here. And the other thing you might notice is that the pattern that you see here kind of gets flopped over and you see the opposite over there. That's because the zero torque point was right here. And as you pass the zero torque point, the sun starts doing the opposite thing than it was doing on the other side of the day. And there's some geometry there with the sun, which I, you can work out uh, while you pay no attention to the rest of the talk. Um, uh, and if you zoom in, that's what it looks like. You can see the six hour uh, variation. You're very quickly, you move very quickly so if you look at this one, here you can see you move very quickly down. That's the thruster firing, and then you drift back. OK, good. And so what we can do with this raw aperture photometry, this is where we've just taken raw measurements of all the stars we see in the field. Um, and we can try to do some kind of dimensionality reduction. And one of the things I've done, I've written a lot about in my life, is that you should never, ever use PCA. And if you are in this audience and you don't know what PCA is, that's good. I'm not going to tell you. And if you do know what PCA is, I want you to know that I'm embarrassed that I'm using it. Good. Anyway, we, we dimensionality reduce the uh, data. And you can see now what this produces is it produces a subspace. So we try to find an empirical subspace that all the stars are varying in. And that's going to be a subspace which like, describes the variability that's imprinted on the stars by the telescope. Because as I said, the causal idea is anything that's shared among the stars must be the telescope. And everything that isn't shared among the stars is hopefully the stars. And then we can find our exoplanets. So, um, so here is motions that are shared among the stars. And not all the stars do the same thing. There's a range of things that the stars do. And that's because some stars are in the top left corner, some are in the middle, some are in the top bottom right corner. This, the satellite is tilting and moving. There's also some temperature changes. Uh, there's various small effects happening that affect all the different stars in the different parts of the device differently but in a correlated way. And so this is a way to describe the subspace in which the stars move. Um, and so we get a set of, these are like basis functions for thinking about stellar variability. So or I mean, for spacecraft variability. So our spacecraft noise model is that it does things like this. OK, so we're building a noise model. I told you it was going to be about noise. Well, maybe I didn't warn you early enough. But anyway, now that you're here, you're going to learn about noise. And if we zoom in on this, you can see it's, there's their six hours again. You can see if we zoom in on these components, there's your six hour effect. OK, good. So if we just take our, our photometry back here and try to fit it as a linear combination of these spacecraft basis functions, we can fit the data amazingly well. We do a really good job of fitting the data. Of course, that's irrelevant, because that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to fit the data. We're trying to find exoplanets. Um, but this is just a demonstration that the data do seem to live in the space of these principal components. And here we're using 150 basis functions. Um, so it's a very, very flexible model. So it's sort of not surprising that it does a good job of fitting the data. Those are the first five of 150. Yeah, we're using 150. We're now, in the end, we're not going, what we're going to do is we're going to marginalize out this noise model. So the goal is to marginalize it out. There's a bunch of linear algebra on one of my slides, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to flash it and invite people to ask me afterwards um, about what we, what we actually do. OK, so here's how we search for exoplanets. The way we search for exoplanets is 
we need exoplan any planet has some period. We're looking over a range of periods. And at, and at any period, so the, think of this as the time axis. So there's a periodic signal. We're looking for a periodic signal with some period. And that at that period, there's many phases to consider. And then we can look at the next period and consider all phases. And these are nonlinear parameters in the sense that we can't build a linear model of the data for the period and phase. So we have some nonlinear parameters. There's this period, there's this phase, and there's a duration of the transit. So there's a few nonlinear parameters. And then there's a depth of the transit, which is a linear parameter. So that we have a one linear parameter and a few nonlinear parameters. We just brute force it. We search the whole space of the nonlinear parameters on a fine grid. It's truly idiotic. Um, the one thing is often when people say here, oh, you're doing you're doing its periodic signals, so why aren't you working in Fourier space? And the reason we don't work in Fourier space is there's a lot of reasons, actually. Many of them relate to missing data and heteroscedastic things and so on. But the, mo the key thing is the signal's very sparse. Remember, there's no signal, no signal, no signal, no signal, 10 to the minus 4. No signal, no signal, no signal, no signal. So you have this very sparse signal. So it's actually not compact in Fourier space at all. And it's very compact in real space. So we do a real space search. Um, we have this. Very flexible noise model. Ignore the first point there, because there's many different projects we're doing here. But the one I'm going to talk about, what we do is we fully marginalize out the noise. So we're going to, there's this 150 parameter noise model. That's your 150 components. We're not going to fit them and subtract them. We're going to consider the posterior beliefs about the exoplanet, marginalizing out all possible values for the noise parameters that are consistent with the data. So we're going to do a full marginalization at every location in this immense grid of hypotheses. So we're testing about a billion hypotheses per light curve, and we're marginalizing out 150 components at every one. But the nice thing is, if we put some nice Gaussian priors here, we're being truly Bayesian, like Bayesian, where Bayesian's a bad word. Um, we are putting a Gaussian prior on all those parameters so that we can do that marginalization analytic analytically. So we're playing games. We're, there's some math games here. Uh, there's also some applied math inside here. Leslie's involved in making our, some of our, uh, our linear algebra very fast. Um, and also, uh, we do a bunch of, we play a bunch of tricks that capitalize on the sparseness of the signal. The fact that there's so much part of, the, such a large part of the data that isn't touched by the signal at all, that allows us to use a bunch of calculations, like reuse a lot of calculations. So we do a lot of, clever things to make this fast. Um, oh, and the most important thing is embarrassing parallelization. Where there's, in the K2 data set, there's 20,000 uh, stars to consider. And between NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi, we have more than 20,000 cores. So um, yeah. OK, so I'm going to flash linear algebra. I'm not going to talk about linear algebra because it's just too boring. Um, but basically, when I th the word chi squared is a terrible word to use in any mixed audience because for statisticians it's a distribution and for physicists it's an objective function and everyone gets all confused. But anyway, our objective function looks like data minus a model, data minus mean, outer pro or inner producted across some kind of noise model. So that's what a chi squared looks like. And if you just do plain old chi-squared fitting that physicists like to do, you would just put your observational uncertainties in that C. But what, we're gonna, what we do is we put our 150 basis vectors in an outer product also inside that C. And then we put in some Gaussian process into that C as well. We put in some kernel matrix into that C. And then we end up getting a, a much more general noise model. So this is the sense in which it's a noise model. We're replacing this trivial noise model you use in when you do chi-squared fitting with a really, a really like complex noise model that involves these 150 basis vectors we found and some covariant thing from Gaussian processes. That is, I, yeah, ask me. If you want to know more about that, I can talk at ages about this. We even, there's a matrix, if you notice, that's infinity in there. It's just horror. So anyway, if you're interested in that, we can talk about it later. Um, OK, good. So, so in our view, the way we think about the, the problem, this noise model, those 150 basis vectors are not, like when we, we fit the data, we fit the data as being a exoplanet signal plus 150 of these basis vectors, 
but then we marginalize out these basis vectors, so they don't actually ever exist. Like we always just marginalize them out. We never instantiate the the amplitudes of those basis vectors. So they don't exist. So we're never allowed to draw a picture like this. We only drew this picture because our referee insisted on it. Um, but this is a picture in which we fit those basis functions and subtract them out. Uh, but we're never allowed to do that because our, from our point of view, you never fit them and subtract them. You, you simultaneously fit your exoplanet hypothesis with them and you marginalize them out. So they don't exist. So this doesn't exist, this figure. But anyway, the referee insisted that it did and we caved. Um, but, uh, but you can see how much more precise we get if you think of it this way, which is a bad way to think of it. Um, we, we get an, an RMS here. The RMS, you know, your eyes see this as the RMS, but the RMS is like this. Um, we have really improved the data enormously in terms of sensitivity. And at this sensitivity, you see, we can see Earths. We can see Earth-like exoplanets because Earth is 100 parts per million. And we, it lasts for 13 hours, so it lasts through 26 data points. So you get root 26 times 3 sigma, so you get a very, you, you, we can detect Earths. Um, and then here's the example I started with. Again, we're not allowed to make this figure because in this figure, which is the figure I started with, we've subtracted out the noise, which we're not allowed to do. Um, but then we do a search step, which I'm not going to give you all the details of the search step, but basically we look for periodic signals. And for this, for this, uh, this example that I just showed you, the eight day, here's our periodogram. It's not really a periodogram. It's some crazy thing we made up. This is like, this is called S over N, but it should be called like horrendous scalar of hackery. Uh, but anyway, whatever. It's a, it's a, we, we, there's a lot of issues when you search for exoplanets because there's a lot of periodic signals in the data. And we do a lot of hacks to make sure that we're getting a periodic signal that is truly an exoplanet. And, and I see Dave Spiegel writing notes, which is making me nervous. But anyway, there's a true exoplanet expert here in the room, by the way, uh, right there. So uh, I'm, I'm you know, really nervous up here. Um, but anyway, uh, and sure enough, there's a signal at eight days. Um, you know, I'm just a data analyst. You know, um, and uh, there it is, and we still have folded and so on. So we can find exoplanets, and in fact, these are the, uh, the here are the thirty something exoplanets we found in this the first campaign of this Kepler data. So this this K2 mission is going to observe twelve fields, and in the first of those twelve fields, we found about thirty exoplanets. So we think we're going to find a few hundred exoplanets. Uh, over the next few years. Here's the first 30. And I'm plotting them in period. There's period. We can't go to very long periods because we only have 80 days of data. And in this analysis, we insisted on there being at least two transits. Uh, we weren't considering very long periods. We have a whole, I have a whole another talk I can give about looking for very long period things. But we're looking for short period things right now because that's the easy stuff. That's the low hanging fruit. And here's this radius of the planet as a function of the radius of the star. And just to be clear, Earth would be right here, just below the bottom of the plot. We don't, in fact, in this data set, find anything quite as small as Earth. And uh, we, it's partly, we do have some stars, like the ones I showed you, where we were sensitive enough that we could have found something as small as Earth. But unfortunately, we just didn't get lucky. The stars that were sensitive enough to find Earth didn't have Earths. And the stars where we did find planets uh, were either noisier or just didn't have things as small as Earth. But we still did find some 30 exoplanets. Um, one of the interesting things about these planets is there, they tend to be around uh, different kinds of stars than the Kepler, the original Kepler mission. The original Kepler mission was focused on G stars, stars like the sun. This mission is more focused on M stars, which are stars that are much cooler and longer lived than the sun. And uh, these planets are very abundant. Actually, the, we're getting a very high abundance for these stars. These stars have more planets than sun-like stars. Uh, I was just wondering, um, is the period is Yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, repeat it. Sorry, I was just wondering um, if there's, is there an M star that the period is towards, and the planets are that subject Ah, yeah. So there's many other ways. Actually, I should have opened with that. There's many other ways to find uh, exoplanets. So the question is could we have found this in another way, like by 
by astrometry, especially since these stars are low-mass stars? Um, the answer is yes in principle, although no planet has ever been found by astrometry yet. Uh, but we expect there to be thousands found by astrometry soon because this Gaia mission has just launched. But you can also find them by radial velocity variations. You can look for the velocity the, as measured by the Doppler frequency of the host star. Um, so there are, and there's, there's multiple other ways. There's microlensing. There's various other ways, direct detections. Um, so in fact, we have now followed up some 30 of these, or some, we've followed up some 20 of these and detected 18 of them by other methods. So actually, these are detectable by other methods, although not stri strictly by astrometry. Another thing you might ask is, since these are around lower mass stars, which are cooler, um, shorter periods are still interesting because you might still be in the habitable zone. And it's true, one of these planets is in the habitable zone, and I should know which one. <laughs> uh, I think it's one of these uh, is in the habitable zone in the sense that if you compute the equilibrium temperature you expect for the planet, it's close to the triple point of water. Um, and it should have a rocky, given its mass, its size, it should have a rocky surface. Um, uh, okay, good. So now if we, have my lights changed color now? Um, so now if we, uh, 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 I, I won't do justice to populations. I always blow too much time on search because search is so fun. And that's really what we spent. I mean, search is the most exciting thing. You find new things. No one's ever found them before. Um, but the bread and butter is to figure out what kind of solar systems are actually out there, given the random stuff we observe. And in order to do that, we have to understand some statistical things about what we detect. And the easy thing to do is to figure out what our false negative rate is. What, what, what objects are we missing that we should be finding? And the way we can do that, the reason we, it's easy to figure it out is it's very easy to inject fake signals into the data and ask, would we recover them if we try whatever? And so this is easy. The hard thing is the false positive rate. In fact, we believe it's impossible to know the false positive rate. Like, how many of these things that we're detecting are not actually planets? And you know, in some cases, you can figure it out. If you have some big object, you say, oh, this is a big Jupiter-sized planet, you can look for radial velocity variations, and they aren't there. And then you can realize that it's actually a sunspot or something else. So there's a lot of times that you can show that individual cases are bad. But when you go to the smallest planets we've ever observed, what are you going to do to confirm them? Like, uh, you could launch another satellite. And it would look at it them, them the same way. Like they're, they're the, the faintest, smallest planets we're looking for are basically impossible to follow up, like for very deep reasons. Um, and NASA is thinking about a future in which we can image these planets. Um, but that future is uh, like they're talking about launch dates of 2035. Um, so uh, I am at my current rate of drinking, I'm unlikely to see some of these. Uh, followed up. So we are, so, and unfortunately, it's really the most interesting objects that are, um, that are uh, the ones that are impossible to understand in terms of false positive. And there's a secret fact, which I would never say if I was on video, um, which is that uh, it might be that many of our most interesting exoplanet candidates are, in fact, false positive. And we're there, we're, the whole community is struggling with this issue now. But from now on in the talk, I've only got a few minutes left anyway. Um, and so I'm just going to assume that everything is cool. We have no false positives. We're rocking it. Um, uh, and uh, here's our completeness, which is like the complement of our false positive rate. Um, there's large numbers in that corner. If, as planets get large, if you have large planets on short periods, they're very easy to find. So these are those are the easy to find. And then as you go to smaller planets and longer periods, they become harder and harder to find. And these are percentages. So down here, we're only detecting like tens of percent of the planets that we would like to be detecting. Um, and this isn't even accounting for the geometric effect that that you have to be aligned to get a transit. So we have to, when we do population inference, we take this kind of completeness, how good we are at finding them, and we multiply it by geometric ratios, which make these numbers look really, really bad. Um, good. And, uh, uh, and then you know, we have to take all those planets and characterize them. I'm not going to talk about characterization. The easy characterizations is the period and the size of the planets. The hard thing is like what they're made of. But I should say, because it's important to say, if people don't know about exoplanets, we actually now know that almost all exoplanets below 
that are 1.6 Earth radii and smaller are made of rock. So we actually know that there are rocky planets out there. And the way we know that is very, if somebody wants to ask me in the question period, I'd be happy to talk about it. I mean, it, many of our people died to bring us that information. Um, OK, good. Uh, good. How do we use the noisy measurement? So now what we want to do is figure out what's the population of exoplanets. So we're going to go Bayesian here. And, and astronomers in general have moved, uh, I mean, astronomers invented Bayesian reasoning, and now we live the dream. Um, but we went through a bad period in the middle. Um, uh, but anyway, um, we're going to try and understand the population. And the way we're going to understand the population is we're going to think of it as a hierarchical model. So we're going to think of it that there's a population, and the population generates exoplanet parameters, and those exoplanet parameters generate an exoplanetary system, and that system generates the data, noisy data. So now we're going to try and infer the population properties in this hierarchical model where there's a population that generates objects which generate the data. Uh, I'm not going to show much details because it gets so boring. Um, Blah, blah, blah. We do some employed math. We, we're, we, a lot of what we do in my group is uh, MCMC sampling. Um, and we like to be embarrassingly parallel. So we send out in parallel jobs. So we built a way to do this kind of inference where you can, you can do all of your individual object inferences independently and then combine them after the fact, which is technically impossible. But with little luck, it does work. Um, we have some important sampling tricks. Uh, they're justified by some math, which you know, if people can ask me about. Blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, more blah. Um, OK, good. Uh, this is incomprehensible plot. But this is now, so I, everything I showed you up to now was the Kepler, the K2 mission. And in the K2 mission, they were only observing 20,000 stars and just for 80 days. And so we only got something like 30 exoplanets. Here's the main mission, Kepler main mission data. Now, this is a particular data reduction of it done by an outsider um, named Pettigura um, at Berkeley. And uh, here is, this now goes for much longer periods, so if you don't like natural based logs, there's the uh, more human readable axis up there, 10 days, 100 days, 365 days is like here on this plot. And then um, th this is the size of the planet, here's one Earth radius, um, and then up there is a Jupiter, so Jupiter's up around two. Um, in, the, in these units, two and a half. Um, so Earth would be right here. So notice the Kepler mission failed to detect anything that's exactly an Earth analog. And these are like completeness contours coming down here. These contours like this are completeness contours. So really, they're Kepler, you know, Kepler's goal was to discover the Earth analogs. And there's some sense in which it failed, although I don't feel bad for them. They really, really rocked it. Um, they, but it turns out stars are a little bit more variable than we thought they were. Um, but, uh, but we're working on it. We're working on it. And each, each year, we're getting a little bit closer to seeing these things down here. So I still have this hope that we will see it. We actually believe there's about nine objects here that are detectable in the Kepler data. And we just haven't found them yet. Uh, but anyway. Um, OK, good. So uh, that's just kind of a picture of our hierarchical inference, which I don't want to tell you too much about. But I will show you the primary results. So here's the primary results of our population inference. The first result is the period distribution. So this is period. For some reason, astronomers use P for period. Don't ask me why. It's annoying. Um, and this is, a, this is a log axis here, you see. So this is a very severe plot. Um, and the solid line is the period distribution of all exoplanets we detect in Kepler. And this is like correcting for completeness and correcting for the inclination, uh, the geometric effect. So this is a true, this is what we think the true population is. And it's very close to being flat in log period, the period distribution, although there is a preference for periods around 30 days or 40 days, which is around the period of Mercury. So actually, a lot of exoplanets are shorter period than Mercury. In fact, we know of a, a five-planet exoplanet system where all five planets are inside the orbit of Mercury. Um, so, so our planetary system is not, in any sense, like 
the median of all exoplanet systems, by, or of planet systems. Um, but then there's some other interesting things here. One is, if you, this is the curve for Jupiter-sized planets. So Jupiter-sized planets tend to be on longer periods, and rocky planets tend to be on shorter periods. So that's interesting. That does mean something about our, so, our solar system might be somewhat normal. Um, uh, one thing is, now, the more exciting thing from the point of view of astronomers is what's the size distribution of exoplanets. So now we're talking about the size distribution. Again, if you don't like natural log units, human readable axis up there, here's Earth size. Here's Jupiter size. Okay, so Jupiter's about 10 times the size of the Earth. So there's Jupiter, Earth size, Jupiter size. And the most, and this is again that horrible log axis. So the features in this plot are really very large. So this feature here, that this peak around two Earth radii is the real peak. We really think the dominant exoplanet in the uh, in the world or in the in the in the galaxy are is around two Earth radii, bigger than the Earth. And this is a size of planet that just doesn't exist in our solar system. We call these super Earths. Some people call them super Earths. Some people call them mini Neptunes. You can call them what you like, but they're between Neptune and Earth. The most common kind of planet is the kind of planet we don't have at all. And it really is the most common kind of planet, because notice that's a log axis. So that really is a substantial um, peak there. Um, uh, good. Uh, and uh, it's on the basis of this that we were able to extrapolate how many Earths, on these two plots, we were able to extrapolate how many Earths we expect. And this gamma sub Earth, that little plus, o plus slash O plus in LaTeX is the Earth symbol. Um, uh, is the rate at which stars have planets that are like the Earth to within a factor of about e. So this is actually the density of planets around stars per lon radius per lon period. So it's like a, it's like a, whatever. It's a box about e in size um, around the period and radius of Earth. And what we find is about two, the peak is around 2%. It's very broad. And the reason it's very broad, the reason we don't pin down this number, like how many stars have Earths, the reason we don't pin down that number so precisely is exactly the reason I just showed you. The Kepler data actually don't have exact Earth analogs in it. So this involves a kind of extrapolation. Uh, and of course, we do that extrapolation probabilistically using flexible models. And so it's ugly. Um, by the way, this is the location of the current community consensus. And we believe that the community consensus is wrong because they haven't properly done hierarchical modeling. They haven't properly modeled the no effect of the noise on the catalogs. And once you, once you, when you sort of deconvolve, as it were, model forward, model the data, including the noise, it tends to uh, concentrate the, the planets to larger masses. So or larger radii. So anyway, it's a long story, but we get a low rate for uh, Earths. Uh, that's a comparison with the literature, which only Dave Spiegel here would care about. Um, OK, good. That was my summary. I said that when I started. My light is yellow. Thank you very much. <laughs>